um, Marie-Fré Rebeillet-Bourgella to talk to us about Philippos Presbyter and his commentary on Job, a work I had never come across um, until this paper presentation. So I think we're all going to learn a lot about it shortly. Marie, um, welcome to the colloquium and over to you. Many thanks, you, and uh, many thanks to the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, Philip uh, or Philippus. I'm I still not decided uh, how precisely I should uh, call him in English, for he's not very well known. <laughs> Um, I'm working on Philip um, for a little more than two years, and it's fascinating how he has a main, uh, how is a very important source for textual tradition, uh, for uh, the history of Bible, as well as for the Old Testament, as for the New Testament. So today, of course, we'll focus on uh, some examples of Philip's uh, New Testament uh, quotation. And uh, there I go. So the Lematic Commentary divided into three books that Philip, a priest and disciple of Jerome, wrote on the Book of Job, has not been critically edited. One of the reasons for this probably lies in the absence of the text for, from the Patrologia Latina. There are two very similar texts uh, in the Patrologia, and that they could therefore be taken as Philip's commentary, and they have sometimes indeed be taken as Philip's commentary. The first is a collection of biblical glosses to be found in the 8th century manuscript in St. Petersburg, and it appears in Patrologia Latina 23. The, this manuscript is also used as a manuscript for critical edition of the text, the biblical text of the book of Job. Uh, the glosses indeed borrow some uh, Philip's, some parts of Philip's text, so that's maybe why it had, uh, they have been uh, mistaken with uh, Philip's commentary. The second uh, text is in uh, Patrologia Latina 26, where it appears under Jerome's name, uh, but it's in fact a ninth, uh, ninth century compendium of Philip's work, and it can be found in three manuscripts, uh, which details I've given on my handout. But neither of them is the full text of Philip's commentary. Nevertheless, two printed editions from the 16th century are available and provide a basis for work. It must be noted uh, that there are a very there is a very important limitation here. Uh, both of them were printed from a single manuscript and not the same one. The, no. the, the, I'm, use, I'm using one of these uh, editions uh, for my own uh, work. It's the C sharp one, and I will often refer to C sharp pagination in my uh, paper and in my handout. Uh, C sharp. Uh, printed is edition of Philip's commentary on um, uh, following a manuscript he claims to have uh, read in the library of the Fulda Abbey. Unfortunately, this, this manuscript is now lost and we cannot compare uh, what Cichar has printed and what uh, the, this manuscript has uh, for a text. The, the second uh, printed edition is not as interesting as it has been attributed to bed, but as also we have the manuscript for it, so I will uh, move on with it. Uh, on, the uh, on the manuscript edition for Philip's commentary, there has been a paper from Michael Gorman uh, 15 years uh, ago, which references I've put in my handout. I will just say there are 11 known manuscripts, several of which are very incomplete. And there are also two sets of fragments. So a critical edition is possible, but uh, sometimes it will, uh, on some, uh, from some part of the work, it will be a little more difficult. Gorman, in his paper, in his paper holds that C Sharp's manuscript, which belongs to a family with much less uh, manuscripts than the others, 
is witness to an inferior recension, while Kenneth Steinhauser, who also wrote about Philip in The Companion to Job in the Middle Age, asserts that Cichard has lectiones difficultes and is therefore most reliable. Only the completion of the critical edition will lead me to figure which family of manuscript is witness to the better text. I would currently agree with um, Steinhauser, but I did I do not have uh, sufficient uh, sufficient collations to uh, assert this with certainty. My presentation aims to show that also it deals with a book from the Hebrew canon, Philip's commentary on Job is an interesting source for the study of Latin translation of the New Testament and perhaps transmit his or two very rare or unknown ver textual variation of the Old Latin translation. Therefore, I will focus much more on Old Latin than on Vulgate. Who was exactly Philip? That's a very good question and we really don't know much about him. We know on him uh, through his manuscripts, the manuscripts of his works, the mention on him in uh, the catalogs uh, from a library uh, during the Middle Age. And we have also a notice I've put on my slide uh, in uh, the Deveris Illustribus uh, from Genadius of Massilia. Uh, Philip is said to be Optimus Auditor Hieronymi, which means he may he must have lived uh, in Bethlehem or Jerusalem, so in the near Middle uh, Eastern, but in the De Viris Illustribus is included uh, after John Cassian notice and before Eucarius of Lyon's notice. So he might have, de have died uh, in uh, southern France, uh, maybe in Provence. Uh, Genadius also said that he died when, while Martian and Avitus were reigning. You have uh, the uh, reigning uh, uh, period on uh, the slide, and you, one can see there are only a very few, a very short period uh, possible for his, his death if we are to believe Genadius. So he would have died around uh, 455. Philip's commentary is the first non-Latin commentary on Job to comment on this book using Jerome translation. But uh, we are, there is uh, some controversy uh, on uh, the datation. Actu uh, currently, the discussion on the datation are based mainly on the identification of Nectarius, uh, which is the um, which is mentioned in the dedicatory epistle uh, at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of the commentary. You can see here a manuscript from the Vatican uh, around the ninth uh, century. Adortantete imo potius compelente nectari pater beatissime is a beginning uh, in an incipit that uh, may remind us some of us of uh, the incipit of the preface from Jerome to the um, uh, gospel translation. And the question is, who was Nectarius? Uh, Kenneth Steinhauser, following others, identifies him with patriarch Nectarius of Constantinople, who died in um, 397. On the contrary, Michael Gorman considers Nectarius of Constantinople to be too high ranking a figure to, for the level of language of the dedication. According to Gorman, therefore, Nectarius should be identified with Nectarius, Bishop of Avignon, who died around the same year and, uh, than, uh, than Philippe, and who was bishop for around 10 years. But there is another element, according to me, which, which could help us to uh, today for the dating of the commentary. It's uh, Philip's quotation from the translation of the Hebrew canon and the Greek books of the Old Testament. Indeed, it seems Philip, Philip is keener to use revision made by Jerome than Old Latin when it comes to Old Testament. If he did really 
what is commentary before um, 397 and that uh, Jerome uh, had revised has completed his revision of the book of, of job around 399 as uh, the data is on which there is currently a consensus, then we'll have a very small, uh, a very narrow dotation, but uh, we, which could help us to, uh, yes, to give a dotation. So, uh, I will, uh, but not uh, all of his old testament citation are Vulgat. I put you on the slide the, uh, which books uh, on Philip Works are from uh, Vulgat translation, Genesis, Numbers, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Malachi, Daniel, and Jonah. That means that uh, the Pentateuch in Philip's work is not all, um, he, he, is, he is not all uh, vulgate, neither all old Latin. So there are problems with this datation uh, uh, related to if we agree that Nectarius was Nectarius Patriarch of Constantinople. There are problems with the traditional chronology of uh, Jerome's revision of uh, the Old Testament translation. The other problem would be Philip's age. If he wrote its commentary before three, um, um, 397 and died around 455, he would have been uh, very young when he wrote his commentary and very old when he died. Uh, I will not go deeper into the Old Testament, but it was very important to set this fact to set out these few facts, for I believe that the way we interpret Philip's attitude toward the Latin text of the Old Testament does influence the way we will interpret his attitude toward the text of the New Testament. Uh, I would uh, say also to, I would give two methodological considerations before moving on into textual analysis. The first one is I'm basing for my presentation on the manuscripts of Philip's commentaries as there have been no critical edition. The studies of these manuscripts has led me to diminish the value to be attached to the lessons of c sharp edition, but not the value to be attached uh, to be given to the family of manuscripts uh, for uh, Cisha edition. And here is why with the example from, from the second book of the Injob's commentary, which is from 1 Corinthians 11.10. Uh, all the um, Cisha has debet mulier wellamen abere supra caput propter angelos. All the manuscripts but him have potestatem instead of velamen. That means even the head of c -shard, um, families of manuscript does not agree with c -shard. That's why c -shard is not to be trusted blindly uh, when it comes to uh, the um, biblical lesson of uh, Philip text. The second point, which is important for us, is that um, c -shard use markers to say, here I'm quoting the Bible. He use marker. Uh, such as Sicut Dicitur in Salmo Evangelio, Utait Apostolos, Dicuo Dicit in Evangelium in Evangelio. He is using much more quotations than allusions, which makes our work uh, a little easier. Why is he using uh, so, uh, so much um, quotation of New Testament? I counted about 20, uh, uh, 200 and 75 for them, and c sharp edition for um, 42 chapters is about 200 pages. That's for a commentary on an Old Testament book. That means he's using, uh, he's quoting the New Testament at least once per page. It's uh, interesting material for us. The reason here um, that it is exegesis is based partially on typological interpretation, job be seen as a prefiguration of the Christ, hence the New Testament citations. Um, I would, uh, it's very 
likely that the gold spells had been revised when uh, Philip uh, wrote its commentary, but he does not hesitate to use old Latin quotation from the gospel, as you can see on uh, this um, a slide with two examples uh, I will uh, come back on uh, in a few time. Therefore, I would say, if Philip text, if Philip's text differs from the Vulgate one, several cases arise. First, his quotation as a complete co-witness in one or more other patristic texts without any variation of wording or of syntax. Second part, his quotation is a mixture of different non-translation uh, but nothing is, uh, seems to be original, only to be found in Philip. And the third case is at least one part of the translation have no co has no co-witnesses uh, known uh, till now. So the first part, Philip's quotation, are identical to wording on the same uh, verses. The first example in Luke uh, 4, uh, 424, is a typical Augustinian uh, wording that uh, is not to be found except in uh, Augustine uh, works and Quod Vuldeus and Orosius works, which were uh, in whose works uh, one can find many Augustinian influence. That arises its lot of problems, and I will uh, sum, sum up these pro uh, this problems uh, after having exposed my uh, three case uh, of uh, Philip's use of quotation. The, the second case, John 8, uh, 44, is more interesting for il est omicida fuit ab initio, uh, which is Philip's lesson, is, uh, can be found in the questiones veteris et novi testamenti of the Ambrosiaster, which was written in Roma before, uh, uh, probably before uh, 380. Uh, so that may have been a translation anterior, uh, prior to Philip's works. And one understand how Philip can I uh, can have uh, known it. The third one of, uh, from Revelation 9, is uh, also a typical uh, African wet old Latin text that is to be found only in uh, Cyprian of Carthage at Quirinum. So we have here three examples that, that show us that Philip borrows its citation from sources, sometimes to be identified, sometimes not to be identified. A more interesting case is for me when Philip's quotation are a mixture of different non-translation. I, I, I forgotten to, gi to, give, to give a very important precision. All the examples I'm giving here are when all the manuscripts are in agreement on the textual lesson from Philip. So I didn't put, I put only one example where there is a little doubt, but it's so interesting that I couldn't not to quote it, but so it's Philip text, we are absolutely sure it's Philip text. Here in John uh, 8, uh, 56, we have in Philip, Abraham pater Wester concupiwit. Concupiwit is to be found again in Augustine and in Quod Wood Deus. However, uh, when uh, Augustine and Quod Wood Deus use concupiwit, they don't use ut videret diem meum et vidit et cavisus est, which is, uh, which is one of the most used uh, translation for this verse, also in Vulgate on Old Latin. So it's not surprising that, that Philip has it here. What is more surprising is that the whole uh, quotation is to be found somewhere after, long after Philip's uh, life, in uh, excerpt by Avitus of Vienne in Flores of Lyons Ontology. I will not enter the interrogation of how did Avitus uh, know, uh, knew the, uh, know this uh, precise translation, as it would uh, lead us 
way too far. Another very interesting um, quotation is on John uh, 18. You have uh, Philip as ep et ipsi non intraverunt in praetorum, praetorium, whereas Vulgat as non introverunt. I found only two places where uh, we uh, have non intraverunt uh, in Ticonius commentary on the revelation as reconstituted by Grayson, and in two manuscripts of the old Latin, whose text don't translate Greek in a miantosine with ne contaminare rentur. That's why it seems to be a mixture of translation. Another case of mixture of translation is in Luke 11. Uh, Vulgat as cum fortis armatus custodit atrium suum, Philip as cum fortis armatus custodit domum suam. One can see here that uh, custodit domum suam is in three old Latin manuscripts, included one which is also conveying non intraverunt uh, um, uh, in our uh, um, precedent example. It's also custody uh, domusam. It's also on uh, opus imperfectum in Mataeum, which is posterior to Philip's text. Uh, another example of a mixture of different non-translation is here, and um, we'll also see for two Corinthians uh, ten uh, seven that there seem to uh, be less attestation uh, for parallels of um, Philip's text uh, in patristic literature than in old Latin manuscripts. This is why uh, Philip's uh, text of the New Testament is, according to me, and in the current state of my research, raising more questions than uh, providing answer on Philip's uh, a source for uh, its text. The last uh, example of mixture of different non translation I would like to give is a very interesting one. As uh, for Luke uh, 12, I did, I, I was not able to find any correctness in the patristic literature. This is, it's the case where one of the manuscripts uh, does not provide plaquit, but con plaquit, which is vulgate. However, as all other manuscripts are in agreement, I thought it fib sex may be plaquit and plaquit as parallel. The most interesting parallel is the Codex Versalensis, one of the oldest old Latin manuscripts, which most probably was was most probably copied before Philip wrote its own commentary, so that there would be no surprise if Philip had, um, re uh, had read it uh, in uh, a manuscript. And third case, the world of or part of Philip quotation have no known co witness. I have selected only two in this case. Luke 1 uh, 79 is the most most interesting for me. I won't say anything on visitor it as a manuscript does not agree, manuscript of Philip's text does not agree on the exact condition of so its C sharp's lesson, but it may not be uh, Philip's lesson. However, it's certain that Luke has ut illuminaret positos that is not to be found anywhere in a complete Lux quotation. Uh, I've discussed it, it with some uh, colleagues and uh, we were all surprised at this, uh, uh, this translation. The only echo I was able to, fi to find is in the Passio Sancti Andreae, a text from the second half of the sixth century, so very posterior to Philip. And this Passio may have been influenced or not by Philip, but uh, I will be absolutely unable to say what has happened. The second case in is one Peter, uh, first, first Peter for one, Vulgat as 
Christo et Guitour passo incarné et tous et adem cogitationné. Philippe at as et tous et odem sansou. Once again, I was absolutely unable to find a co-witness for Eodem Sansu in this quotation of First Peter. But I've, uh, I've tried to show that Philip's uh, quotation have, co uh, have very frequently co-witnesses. So if there, uh, there are no co-witnesses, it may only be that we don't know co-witnesses, but they may have been co-witnesses that we have lost. Uh, a few, uh, uh, I would like to say also that uh, two interesting points can be noted. There is a kinship between some, some of uh, Philip quotation and Augustine biblical quotation, and that's the point I couldn't uh, go further uh, till now, but uh, I intend to work on it. And the, seg uh, the second point is there may be a kinship too between uh, the African Old Latin text and Philip Old Latin text. Not everywhere and in every place, but Philip may, I, uh, may have known very well the African Old Latin text and there are uh, other, there are Old Testament uh, quotation of uh, African typical, te typical text that may uh, lead us to this conclusion also. On the conclusion, uh, I would like to say that the analysis of the biblical quotation may suggest that Philip towards the New Testament has a more, a less coherent guideline than with his Old Testament quotation. Is is thus following the four steps of his master, Jerome, whose uh, preference was for uh, the Hebrew books and who did not pay the same attention to the revision of, of New Testament translation as he did to the old. It's a possibility, but there are no formal proof for this. Nevertheless, as with the Hebrew canon and the great deuterocanonical canonical books, the biblical quotation from Philip's text led lead to suggest that he had at hand a very extensive documentation. Then, thus, for the Hebrew canon, my current work turns towards the observation of a great knowledge of biblical commentaries of and of textual traditions, Old and New Testaments, that currently subsist mainly in the Eastern Christianity. This detailed knowledge of the textual tradition seems to me to be reflected in the developed city of tradition with the New Testament quotation of Philip's echo, whether voluntar voluntarily or involuntarily. Therefore, Philip may have used what uh, he is calling mental text. That means he knew so much uh, textual tradition that he didn't voluntar he didn't really uh, combine the them one with each other, but he thought of all of them and that uh, led him to use an original text. Finally, a study of Philip biblical quotation shows that the question of the provenance of Philip biblical material cannot be separated from the question of the dating of its work. Uh, uh, if Augustine is a, is only co-witness and that Augustine works uh, which are co-witnessed with uh, New, Testament, New Testament quotations have been weighted after Philip's uh, commentary. Did they have the same sources? Uh, that is raising a lot, a lot, a lot of, of questions that uh, I, to which I cannot provide any answer. Now, it's quite possible that the publication of a critical edition of the commentary on Job will not resolve the many questions that arise in the study of Philip biblical material, which I tried to, get, I tried to give a very brief insight during this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Marie. And again, there's lots of material there for us to discuss. Tom O'Loughlin has put a question in the chat um, to me. I will broadcast that um, 
to the world, um, which is his question is, was Philip used by other commentators on Job, such as Gregory, so that quotes from Philip could be used as fragments for reconstructing his text? What, what evidence is there of, of the afterlife of Philip's commentary? Uh, yes, I, uh, it seems it has been used a lot. And uh, I will go back to the Old Testament for this. Uh, there are, there seem to there seems to have some variation in the job biblical text of Philip that are to be found uh, in uh, Gregory and uh, till the Middle Age, some may be found even in uh, Thomas of Aquinas. So it will be uh, a task uh, it will, after having uh, put, um, reconstructed a critical edition for Philip's text, Mm, I will search from uh, Philip's posterity in uh, the Middle Ages, the uh, late antiquity, for I found many traces. I've already found traces of its posterity, but it may also be a circular reasoning. That means if uh, manuscripts are disagreeing on Philip's uh, biblical uh, quotation, uh, looking at uh, possible posterity could influence us when determining which family of manuscripts is uh, carries the best lesson. So it's, uh, it must be taken into consideration, but one has to be very careful when using what can seem to be a Philip pro uh, quotation, probable quotation from Philip's, uh, Philip in the Middle Ages. Great, thank you. Um, can I put a question? Um, in the example you gave us on the Sishar's edition, I'm intrigued on the use of Velamen at 1 Corinthians 11.10, because that is found elsewhere in Latin patristic yeah. tradition. It's in a lot of quotations, but it's not directly in biblical manuscripts. So where do you think um, Sishar got that reading from? Oh, I've absolutely no idea. And I would very much uh, like to know as there are a very good part of listen that uh, no one else than Cichar has, but as we don't know anything on his manuscripts, only that in, uh, we only know that he gave a dedicatory epistle to Philip's commentary, uh, most probably to act like uh, Jerome and Philip. And he, in this dedicatory epistle, he thanks very much the Bishop of Fulda, the abbot for having let him uh, see a manuscript but we don't know anything else. It may be the same manuscripts on that was listed in the catalog of the Moorback Abbey, and that is also lost, but uh, it's only conjectural and I can't say anything else, but it's also very curious to me for it's, it was an intriguing uh, variant uh, in uh, First Corinthian. Yes. Thank you. So we have a qu third question from Christina Kleinecker um, saying that she's not surprised to hear that Philip is Christological in his interpretation of the Old Testament, because we can see this in early Christian writers as well. Did you come across other typical interpretations uh, in Philip as well, such as interpreting everything through the eyes of Ecclesia, the church? Um, yes, about one per page. <laughs> And one of the most, most surprising was uh, at the very beginning of the commentary where Phillips is interpreting the name of Job's uh, region of birth, Shus, Us, as the Holy Virgin. <laughs> that was almost the most surprising I came across, but uh, yeah, I think almost everything. Uh, and most everything is, is typical, is uh, Christological. Uh, the three friends of, of Job are seen to be the heretics, the pagans. Um, he, don't, he, does, he doesn't simply know what to do with um, uh, Booth uh, at the end of the book, but it, it would be too long today to list all the parts where is using a typical interpretation as he is he's constantly doing this. He's quoting the lemma. He's giving it, uh, Hebrew etymologies. 
is giving some parallels with all the other translations, sometimes of like uh, other translation of the lemma, sometimes of old Latin, sometimes uh, more difficult to identify. And then after, is giving the typical uh, interpretation, so that the, uh, the constant uh, during the commentary. Super, thank you very much. Thank you for being prepared to take questions as well. We will continue um, with our general question and discussion group afterwards, but I will close the formal proceedings at this point.